Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith again. I'm continuing a series of videos on the albedo of the Earth, specifically the albedo of the Arctic and how it's changing. And there was one of the key findings that I talked about in the previous video was this, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography research highlight, loss of Arctic's reflective sea ice will advance global warming by 25 years. So basically, the... Um, the loss of Ar the reflectivity of the Arctic would be the would cause the equivalent warming um, of 25 years at current levels of greenhouse gas emissions, and which are basically 40 gigatons of CO2 per year times 25 years. We're talking about a trillion tons of CO2 added, because basically, effectively added to the system equivalently. Uh, because of loss of Arctic sea ice. And when you can compare that to the 2.4 trillion tons of CO2 that have been emitted since the um, Industrial Revolution, you can get an idea for how abruptly climate system will change when there's no Arctic sea ice. And we're rapidly heading to a blue ocean event, a world with no Arctic sea ice. Now, there is an important assumption um, with this 25-year um, warming and that's that the, cloud ref the clouds don't change that much. And we can't assume that, really. We know that as you get more and more exposed areas of open water, there's more evaporation. Therefore, there'll be clouds forming over the open water, whereas clouds did not, um, w did not form so much over the... I mean, the source of water wasn't there for uh, when the Arctic sea ice was intact. So... You know, the study does say that the, um, you know, if there were no cloud, it, it assumes a nominal level of clouds, because if it was clear skies, it says the effect would be three times larger. Um, the, the loss of Arctic sea ice would be three times larger than what they're saying. Um, and if there was complete cloud cover, the loss, the effect of the loss of sea ice would be half of what they're saying. Um, so I'll talk about, I did find a study that shows that about 81% cloud cover is expected. So that will some, that'll mitigate the, the, lo the regions where sea ice is lost a little bit, but not, not uh, counteract it. Okay, so I'm going to just continue on. Um, so this is, the, the, this is the study that is actually vital. You know, it just came out July 22nd. You know, it's actually a very, very key study that gives you a, an idea as to what will happen. And I couldn't find this study. I went to Google Scholar. I looked, uh, I Googled radiative heating of an ice-free Arctic. Um, you know, um, I Googled the authors. I, I wasn't able to find the study, but when I do find it, I'll do a, uh, it's important, it's key, so I'll do a study. Basically, the loss of sea ice will add a globally average 0.7 watts per square meter of solar heating to the Earth's system. We've already had 0.21 of that 0.7 between 79 and 2016 from the loss of Arctic sea ice. And losing the reflective power will lead to a warming equivalent to 1 trillion tons of CO2 and advance basically the 2 degree threshold by 25 years. Okay, so that's the key finding. So I googled the paper, couldn't find it, but I did find a number of interesting papers, which I'm, some of which I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, there was a very important paper that came out um, early, early this year. You know, um, when did it come out? I think it, it was, came, came out online. Uh, it says the Discussion started 5th of December, 2018. Anyway, it's climate feedbacks in the Earth system and prospects for their evaluation. So this is probably worth the whole video itself. It's all the latest on the different feedbacks that we can expect. And if I go to page 14 of 94, there's, uh, there's something I want to show you. Um, basically, this is fast physical climate feedbacks, and it lists them all atmospheric thermodynamic feedbacks, plank response, water vapor lapse rates, clouds, the rise of the cloud tops, tropical low clouds, mid clouds, cloud water, snow albedo, CO2 stomata, water feedbacks. It ranks them all as thermal, short wave, reflectivity slash albedo. Okay, so that's the short wave incoming light from the sun. If the albedo changes on the earth, you get all these feedbacks. 
thermal long wave, that's heat redistribution, including water vapor moisture. So long wave, that's basically heat rising up from the earth, how that's affected by all of these things. Atmospheric composition, greenhouse gases without water vapor and greenhouse gases and particles, non-greenhouse gases and particles. So that would be water vapor and aerosols. So there's all of these things in here. There's all of these um, fast climate, physical climate feedbacks. There's the earth system feedbacks. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things covered in this table. So, you know, it's probably worth a whole separate video, but I just want to point it out to you. I can't do videos on everything. You know, I have to discriminate. I have to try to find the things that are most important, but feedbacks is a key factor. So I'll probably do a very technical, uh, uh, you know, video on that at some point. Okay, this is the key finding. High cloud coverage over melted areas dominates the impact of clouds on the albedo feedback in the Arctic. So what this is saying is that when we lose Arctic sea ice over a specific region, then there's open water, there's more evaporation, and that's creating clouds. And we're getting actually high clouds over these regions. The observations suggest that when sea ice retreats, cloud fraction of the ice-free region remains fixed at nearly 81%. The high cloud coverage over melted areas significantly reduces the albedo feedback. These results indicate that space-based LIDAR cloud, so laser radar cloud, and surface observations of the Arctic can help constrain and improve climate models. So it's not just a case of, you know, lose Arctic sea ice, you know, it, the surface is much darker, you get tremendous warming. If you lose Arctic sea ice, there's more evaporation of the water that creates clouds which are above the areas where the sea ice used to be and that, that somewhat mitigates the, um, the, 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 the albedo change. How much does it mitigate it by? Well, you know, the devils are in the details of this paper. Um, so, you know, this paper is also worth a discussion. There's all kinds of you know, clouds in 20, 2006 and ice in 2006, and there's correlations done between them. But the gist is, is that, um, you know, when you, in the areas where you lose sea ice, probably worth the whole video by itself, but in the areas that you lose sea ice, um, you have 81% cloud coverage over those regions, and that reflects some of the incoming sunlight. So it's not like you replace, you, you replace the uh, really light sea ice with high reflectivity with open water okay you replace it with open water you know in 19 percent of the area and you replace it with clouds in 81 percent of the area the net effect is a darkening arctic but not as much as it would be without the clouds so you need to definitely consider consider the clouds um, this paper is talking about arctic amplification how we get sea ice loss increased co2 large arctic amplification you know, it talks about when it occurs, uh, you know, the months it occurs, because the Arctic amplification occurs more, um, you know, in certain months. I mean, the winter months are warming much, much faster in the Arctic than the summer months. The summer months are pegged, right, because of the uh, melting ice. So there's a lot of information in this study about the seasonal change. Uh, these are all open source papers. You're welcome to look at them yourself, and I will talk about some of them specifically in other videos. This is uh, the contribution of sea ice albedo and insulation effects to Arctic amplification. You know, it, there was an Earth system model that was simulating the Pliocene, simulating a period of time when, um, you know, how, when things, you know, back in the past to see, you know, to get a better grip on what's happening now. How much do clouds mask the impacts of Arctic sea ice and snow cover variations? So using reanalysis data, you know, similar things. Like this is what we can see. So this is Greenland, for example, one day, open water here. And this is, you know, looking from satellites at Greenland the next day, you know, and it's all white. We've got clouds socked in, completely covering things. So obviously the albedo changes, the effect on heating are gonna be very different this day from this day. Okay, uh, so clouds do have a huge effect, as we know, and this study goes into, uh, you know, some of the details of that. Probably also worth a complete separate video. Uh, remote sensing of the Earth's energy budget, right, how it depends on albedo, but albedo of the atmosphere and surface. 
Um, this is a whole thesis, sea ice variability in the Nordic seas over the Dansgaard Osher climate cycles. So, you know, 40,000 years ago, we had all of these Dansgaard Osher cycles, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, you know, and that had a, did, how that affected the sea ice variability. Um, probably well worth reading. I just wanted to point out that the, the thesis uh, exists. And then, you know, there's other things that I found. Uh, this is about this is about solar radiation management to try to prevent sea level rise that will take out coastal cities, um, the ocean in motion. I taught a course in oceanography recently, so I'm kind of focusing on that. People have asked me about fusion energy. I found this um, art, this this uh, book, The Future of Fusion Energy, excellent for the reader who wants to understand the fusion quest. Okay, and there's some pre reprints and stuff or there's a couple chapters posted. I don't have the book yet, but I should do something on fusion, fusion energy, a you know, video on that soon. But basically, let's get back to what's happening right now in the Arctic. So massive wildfires in the Arctic. Vast areas of the Arctic are, are presently engulfed in flames and wildfires that experts called unprecedented. There have been fires in the Arctic, but not this many. You know, there's huge plumes over Siberia. There's some, there's some over Canada. They're all up in the Arctic, on Greenland and so on. So let's have a look. Well, remember this, if we just Google, Google Earth Null School, bring up Earth Null School, go here. Let's look at the Arctic region. Okay, so focus here on the Arctic region. Go Earth, go uh, chemistry, uh, carbon Let's look at sulfur dioxide. Okay, uh, carbon dioxide is less sensitive. So let's look at, this. sorry, carbon monoxide. Okay, so here's carbon monoxide over the Arctic and you can see it up here and then we'll go back. Okay, so we can focus, you know, zero in a little bit. This is over Siberia, for example. Okay, so we're looking over Siberia and we're going back. Look at all of this CO, this is all coming from fires. Sulfur dioxide, you can see it here. It's more sensitive if you look at particulate. This is everything less than a micron in size. Look at it here, two and a half micron, 10 micron. Okay, all these different depictions. So you can see these massive fires here. You can see stuff coming up from Alaska. There's no industry there. If you're down further south, you can attribute these things to industry and cities, etc. But up here, there's no industry. It's just the Arctic and the permafrost and the snow and ice. So you can see the sources of these coming from these fires here. So we'll go back to uh, chemistry, carbon monoxide, and then let's have a look back. You can see how day to day, okay, and this is the month of July, you can see all of these fires. And one of the problems is these fires are burning in peat. So let's have a look at that. The Arctic is on fire. It might be creating a vicious climate feedback loop. Yeah, no, no kidding. Wildfires raging for over a month now, releasing huge amounts of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Unprecedented fires started in June, very, very hot temperatures, very dry. Um, then they've been spreading, dumping so much smoke, it can be seen from space. Smoke's blanketing Russian cities. Um, and so, so local residents have started a change.org petition to declare a state of emergency, over 400,000 signatures. This is a Copernicus satellite showing the aerosols. Look at this, these fires over Alaska, they're being carried, the smoke's being carried right up over the North Pole there, making it darker, you know, contribute. This is another huge feedback effect. It's adding more CO2, causing more and more warming. Uh, and it's in peatlands, okay? Peatland fires can burn for months, years, or decades. They don't always produce massive flames, but they eat away at the carbon, the, the, the carbon sink. Okay, peat fires burn old carbon. The carbon's taken thousands of years to accumulate in a few weeks and can burn through hundreds of years worth of carbon sequestration. So this is, a, this is an example of how the climate system will eventually produce more CO2. This is a paper that's referenced about boreal fire regime changing, you know, and the peat can just, you know, the bizarre peaty science of Arctic wildfires you can read you know, about how these fires are huge emitters of, of CO2. And 121 megatons was released so far already. That's more than what Belgium emits each year. The previous record, 110 megatons, was in 2004, but we're only in June. We've got a lot of fire season left. So we're in 